to the Sibley Historic Site. My name is Jessica. I'm our current site supervisor. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Mendota After Hours event. Mark Levine will be speaking about French Canadian heritage here in Mendota. Here's Mark Levine. Welcome everybody and again I'm Mark Levine. I'm, I'm involved in the French American Heritage Foundation and just so, if you never heard of us before we're a bunch of history nuts that focus on French American heritage in Minnesota which, and we have a lot of fun doing speaking engagements, we put on events. The whole idea is to have fun and to educate Minnesota about the early French heritage in Minnesota and tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the early French in Mendota and right here and I'm going to try to cover the period from around 1659 to 1837 and we'll see how it goes. I've got an hour, right? I got one hour, so I'm gonna do the I'm gonna do the best I can in one hour. <coughs> but you know where we are right now. We are at the place where waters meet. This is I don't know if you know this, but this is really a magical place. This is a birthplace. This is a place where things began. The Dakota people were here for we don't know how long, as long as time can remember. But the, in the Dakota legend, this is where their people began. This is where their, this is their Garden of Eden. This is where they believe they were first come down to this planet and started their, their people. It was a magical place for them. But not only that, it's a, it's a place, it's the birthplace of our modern state of Minnesota, right here. The place where waters meet. This is a magical place. This is a birthplace. So we're going to talk a little bit about about this place that's the confluence of two rivers, the current Minnesota River and the Mississippi River. And, you know, we don't know how long, like I said, we don't know how long the Dakota people were here. They didn't, they didn't write things down, but they were here a long time. They left, they left their mark. A lot of the names of Minnesota, Minnesota, uh, Dakota, you know, we, we know they were here. We, they left their name. Benamakaska, of course, is a Dakota name. Mendota, Mendota. That's, that's, Medota means the place where waters meet. Medota or Bedota, uh, that's, we, we, we remember the Dakota people from their names. We also, they left the, their burial mounds. They left thousands, they, were, they estimate 12 to 13,000 Indian burial mounds were in Minnesota when the Europeans first came here. And who, and when did the Europeans first come here? Were they, the first French Explorers, and we have a descendant of one of them was Grossi and Radisson, and that was about 1659. They two French explorers who came here, Grossier and Radisson, we know because they started the Hudson Bay Company, and they were the first, really the first European French here in Minnesota. But another early ex uh, person here, and we think we believe that the first person who really realized and discovered this place where waters meet was a guy named Pierre Charles Lesseur. Now we all know about Louis Hennepin. He came. He came here in, in 1680, and he discovered the Chute Saint Antoine, the Falls of Saint Anthony. And that was in 1680, and he wrote a book about it. The book has a lot of exaggerations and whatnot, but it's a very entertaining book. If you ever want to read something interesting, it was written way back in the 1600s. But he, he doesn't say anything about this place, and so he we don't know why. Maybe he missed it. He, he was on the Mississippi, and he didn't see this, this <laughs> Minnesota River. <laughs> but Lesseur did. He said, when he was talking to the cartographer, he said, we named this river St. Pierre because we were here in 1683, three years after Hennepin, and there were five of us. Three of us were named Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> and we were here on June 29th, which was the feast of St. Paul and St. Peter. And so we figured it was suitable to name the River St. Pierre. And you, in the early, one of the things that the French did for Minnesota is they created these maps. And this is the 1702 map. And you can see in the 17 map, it's got Riviere St. Pierre. It also has the Dakota name, Wata Minnesota. That was what the Dakota called it, Wata Minnesota. But it also has the Riviere St. Pierre. This is 1702. There's also a 1697 map that has Riviere St. Pierre. So we know that. The name was, the French were here before 1702, obviously, 1697. But I'm pretty sure that what happened was the surname named River St. Pierre based upon what he said in his memoirs. Forget that Saint Pierre thing down there. <laughs> <laughs> so now we've got the story here. He's, he's discovered this, this wonderful place where waters meet. And along comes another guy named Nicholas Perrault. 
And Nicholas Bro built a fort, St. Antoine, on the, on the Lake Pepin in 1686. And he was a, a king's lieutenant. He was given authority by the king of France and the governor of New France to come out here and represent the kingdom of France. And he came out here, and Lesore was, he knew Lesore. They were, he was one of his aides or whatever, lieutenants or whatever. And so they decided in 1689, they decided, and here's how they used to do this in the old days. It was kind of neat because it was a lot easier. To, it was a lot easier way to acquire land. So in 1689, they went up to Lake Pepin, at the at the site of this Fort Saint Antoine right here, and you, and the, this is still on Lake Pepin. You can go to Lake Pepin and find out where this fort was. And the uh, they they call it the Doctrine of Discovery. The European countries would come to this new, wonderful new land, and the deal was if you got there first, you could declare this to be your land. This is my land. So that's what Perot did, and the French would always be very, uh, uh, you know, they, when they did it, they had to put a lot of flourish to this proclamation. So, you know, they'd like to have a little music, and they'd have a cross, and they'd have flags, and they'd have soldiers dressed up in their uniform, and they'd shoot a couple shots off, and they'd ideally get a few Native Americans, and Perot would have this big ceremony in 1689, actually May 8th, 1689, and he declared on May 8th, 1689, I hereby proclaim that this land, including the place for waters meet, right here, belongs to the king of France. And that's it. No warranty deed, no title deed, <laughs> no realtor. And you know, who cares the fact there might be you know, thousands of people living there? This land belongs to me now. It was wonderful. It was a great way to acquire land when you were in those days. And now, this land belonged to France. This is this is territory of France. And so for the, for the next hundred years or so, the French were in Minnesota. And the 1700s has all kinds of things going on with the French being in Minnesota. Like we say, we wrote a book called They Spoke French, because they spoke French in Minnesota for 200 years before it became a state. And the 1700s was pretty much the only Europeans who really were French. I mean, there were some Scottish and some English, but for the most part, the French were, were dominating, building forts, doing four trading posts. And then, of course, you know, 1760, we all know what happened. They had the French and Indian War. I was going to show you a picture. Uh, this is a uh, statue of Nicholas Perrault that's uh, at Green Bay. He was the kind of the commandant at Green Bay. And Nicholas Perrault, you know, I have, I have an affinity to Nicholas Perrault. He's my sixth great grandfather, so I need a little connection. <laughs> but the French fur traders were, were here during the 1700s. But then something happens in 1760, and that is the French and Indian War goes badly for the French, so they make a treaty, and as part of the treaty, they, they deed over the their rights, their territorial rights to this property. All the property east of the Mississippi is deeded over to, to England. Now the property west of the Mississippi, you think about this, east of Mississippi now belongs to Great Britain, according to the Doctrine of Discovery. West of the Mississippi still belongs to France, but because the France was in kind of a pickle, what, what King Louis XIV did is he deeded over this property, and probably just decreed it over to Spain, his cousin, King Philip of Spain, that his, was his cousin. So Spain, in 16, 1762, officially that wasn't the exact date, I was talking to my cousin about this, in 1762, the land west of the Mississippi belongs to Spain. So for a while here, this is Spanish territory. It's Spanish territory from 1762 to 1800. Then in 1800, a guy named Napoleon Bonaparte makes a deal with the Spain. I don't think Spain had much to say about this. I think he lost, they Spain lost a few battles. He takes it back. So now, in 1800, the land belongs back with France. This, is, this belongs to France again. <coughs> And, and Napoleon had great, he had great aspirations. He was going to, this place where Otto's meet was going to be a French colony. And he was going to colonize it and all this stuff and other stuff. But something happened on the way to his dream, and that is called Santo Domingue or Haiti. They had the Haiti Rebellion. It didn't go well. Spain lost, basically, France basically lost Haiti. And Napoleon decided it wasn't worth it. So he sold this land to Thomas Jefferson for... And we, me and my cousin were figuring this out for three cents an acre. <laughs> Good deal. It was, it was uh, 828,000 square miles for 15 million bucks. So now, 
the land belongs to the United States of America under this doctrine of discovery. Never mind that the Native Americans have nothing to say about what's going on. <laughs> this is European thing. So now we, we have the Louisiana Territory belongs to the United States, the Louisiana Purchase. Lewis and Clark head up the river. Thomas Jefferson appoints a guy named James Wilkinson to be the territorial governor. He was the senior general in the very small U.S. Army at the time. And Wilkinson was an interesting guy. So now he's in charge. He's in charge of this territory. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt once described General James Wilkinson as one of the most despicable characters in the history of the United States. <laughs> and, and, the, and the word, uh, um, another word that you see a lot from from him is a scoundrel. He's, he's, re he's referred to as a scoundrel many times. But what, why would people be so mean to this guy? Well, <laughs> number one, he was a liar. He was a narcissist. And he was colluding with another country. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so he had this scheme, and I, I don't know where he was, but he had this scheme with Aaron Burr. They were gone. He was, uh, he was the territorial governor of the United States for the Louisiana Territory, but he was a paid spy by Spain. He was, the, he was coll colluding with Spain to get the property back for Spain, and Spain was in turn was going to give him a piece of property, and him and Aaron Burr were going to start their own country. <laughs> so we got this wonderful, despicable scoundrel who is in charge. But what does he do? He does the right thing. He's in, he's in charge. So what does he do? He, he's got a fort. He's in St. Louis, and he's, he's at Fort Bellefontaine. French fort that, that now becomes part of America. And he sends this guy named Zebulon Pike. He says, he says Zebulon, and he's a young lieutenant, I want you to head up to the Mississippi River and check out this area because I want to see if we can build some forts up here because I'm worried about the British. And you know, and this is this is our job. We've got to check this out. So and Zebulon is a is a good loyal soldier. Zebulon was an interesting guy. He was a kind of a short guy. He was a bookish parent, he liked to read books very intelligent person. His dad was a hero in the Revolutionary War. He eventually became a general himself and he died fighting in the War of 1812. And of course we know about Pike for a couple reasons. Uh, Pike's Peak in Colorado, that's after Zebulon. And there's an island right over there called Pike Island, named after this guy. Apparently he's described in the history books as being pompous. <laughs> and apparently he was starting and when he talked he'd have his head at an angle like this. He'd talk with his head like this in a very pompous way. Um, but but his, his job, he, he got like 15 soldiers and they came up the river. And his job was to try to make a deal to find a place to build a fort. Well, he gets to the place where waters meet. He gets to here and it's like, wow, this is it. This is where we're going we to build our fort. I mean, what the heck? And when he gets up here, there's a guy named Jean-Baptiste Fairbow who's who's hanging out here in the summertime, and I, I'm sure Fairbowl helps him. There's not, he did write some memoirs, Fairbowl, he stayed with Fairbowl, we know that he had connections with Fairbowl, we're not sure exactly how the whole thing played out, I mean, maybe it's somewhere, but I didn't find it. But he gets seven chiefs, Dakota chiefs, from the area. Um, and he gets them all together, and they all meet at Pike Island. That's why it's called Pike Island. And they're gonna make a deal. He says, and he's got, he says, okay, um, Here's the deal. I want, I want to buy 100,000 acres for 2,000 bucks, and I also will throw in 60 barrels of whiskey. <laughs> and that was the deal. There were there were seven chiefs, and they, all, they did their powwow. That's probably in the edge of the woods. Probably looks something like this picture. This is a uh, George Catlin picture. And all he says is his memoirs. He says I was. He met with these seven chiefs, he describes who they are and they're from this area. And all he says in the memoir is that I was replied to by two chiefs. So two two of the chiefs, and they didn't sign the they didn't sign, they didn't know how to sign, they put their X. So two of the chiefs have their X. And and, the, and he gave two hundred dollars for the gifts, because he didn't have two thousand dollars. He, he had two hundred dollars for the gifts, he gave two hundred dollars for the gifts, and he gives them the sixty barrels of whiskey. And, and a barrel of whiskey was about, an, was about a gallon. So, and that was the Treaty of 1805. And that's it. Uh, 
and later in 1856, a, a Senate Congressional Committee did a, did a study of this Treaty of 1805 and determined that it wasn't a valid treaty because <laughs> number one, we don't know we don't know if the whiskey was drank before the, the signature or after. <laughs> But 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 it was a, it's one of the pivotal treaties in the history of Minnesota. Very interesting. And the read the history books, it's like this was a legitimate treaty. But but when you think about it, it was authorized by a scoundrel. It involved a lot of whiskey. There the consideration it was a, it was supposed to be two thousand dollars. Well, the two thousand dollars was never paid. They got two hundred bucks, and later on, the the re, the remaining eighteen hundred dollars was up the river, but it never really got to the Dakota, so they never really got paid. The it never became, never got put in the statute books. The president never proclaimed it. It never really was authorized by Congress. It never really was a valid treaty. But this was the treaty in which the authority to build Fort Snelling and the authority for the really the beginning of the state of Minnesota was made. One of the one of the persons at this treaty of 1805 was a guy named Petit Corbeau, Little Crow. Petit Petit Corbeau in French is, means Little Crow. Little Crow is an interesting. Person and that name Little Crow is it plays an important part of Minnesota history because the Little Crow was kind of a like a like a, a title or whatever it's like the, the king the Little Crow dynasty and I know of at least four Little Crows when I read when I do my research there was a Little Crow that went to Montreal in 1749 when the French were basically in control here and I don't we don't it doesn't say where Little Crow came from but. My guess is that it was it was from the same village, because this little crow came from Kaposia. Is everybody Kaposia is in West Saint is in South Saint Paul. In fact, if you drive down Congress Street, you can see a big flag where where that village was. And little crow was the chief of that village. And little little crow, Petit Corbeau, they called him, was one of the guys who put his ex on this treaty of 1805. Now the second now the so we got one little crow in, in 1749. We got a, we got a little crow. Signed the Treaty of 1805. His, the next little crow was called Big Thunder, and he's involved in history. He was involved in the Battle of the Battle of Kaposia in 1842, and my one of our ancestors was knew Big Thunder and was involved in that in that battle. And then the 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 last little crow that we know about was the leader of the Dakota during the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, who was killed at the uh, at the end of the war. So there were actually four little crows involved in our history, and they're, and they're definitely part of our history. The other person who was at the Treaty of 1805 was a guy named Jean-Baptiste Ferbeau. Of course, that's a port name in Minnesota history, and if you go down the hill right there, there's the Ferbeau house. That was his house, Jean-Baptiste Ferbeau. He was, he was born in 1775 in Quebec. His father was a lawyer. Three of his brothers were lawyers, but he wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted to be a fur trader. And so he, he formed a, him and two other guys formed this small little fur trading company. And he went to Illinois and he worked there for a while. And he, then he went to Iowa. And then he, he came up here and he was at uh, called uh, Little Rapids. And it was right by Chaska. And he, had, he was basically an independent fur trader. And he would do his winter fur trading. You know, they always did their fur trading business in the wintertime. Anybody know why they did that in the wintertime? Furs were a lot thicker. Yeah. Much, much nicer furs in the winter. In the summertime, they kind of took their, took their time off and enjoyed the summer. In the wintertime, they did all the work. And he'd spend his winters at, at the Little Rapids. Little Rapids is right by Chaska, and they call it Little Rapids. It was, it was a good place. There was a, there was a Dakota village here, about 300, 300 to 400 people. It was a good place for a fur trading post because we, we were taking canoes or boats up the Minnesota River. You came to the Little Rapids, you had a portage there. You couldn't go through the rapids. So everybody had to get off their boat in Portage. So it was a great spot for a fur trading post. And that's where he had his fur trading post. So he was here when when uh, Zebulon and Pike came and did the Treaty of 1805. He was called Beaver Tail by the Dakota. He, he was a respected trader. He did very well in his in his fur trade. He he in 1805 he married this woman called Pelagi Holmes. And Pelagi Ons, her father, her mother was a Dakota woman from the, the Little, Little Rapids uh, village. And her father was this interesting character named Joseph Louise Ons. And when you read about him, he was a, he was a fascinating guy. He was a French-Canadian, and he ended up, after the 
conquest of 1760, he worked for the British as a king's interpreter, which is a very important job. It was a well-paid job, a high-status job, in, in Mitchell and Mackinac, and he had a fairly illustrious career. Has anybody read the book Northwest Passage about Robert Rogers? Everybody heard of the, of the U.S. Rangers? Well, the first guy, the guy that basically started the U.S. Rangers was a guy named Robert Rogers, a very intense guy, but he was the commander at Michel Mackinac, where Hans worked. And he was court martial for corruption, and uh, Hans was one of the witnesses against him and got in trouble for that. But he was sent up here on a mission to give gifts to the, to the Indians, to the Dakota, to try to build up goodwill. And that's, that's when he came up here in the, in the uh, 1700s, and that's probably when he had relations with the Dakota woman, and that's when Pelagi probably was conceived. And, and in that trip, on the way back, he was supposed to be giving his gifts away. He was accused of actually selling the gifts. <laughs> so he got in a lot of trouble from this trip. But he had a daughter as a result of it. And his daughter, Pelagi, married Jean Baptiste Fairbowl. And she was apparently, she's she very interesting woman, Pelagi Fairbowl. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about her. But apparently she was a great hostess. And one of the one of the things that everybody says in Fairbowl when you read about his uh, Read about him in the history books, and here's his here's his house that's right down the way. Is that he was a great host, and I've read a couple articles about this. And you know, you think about it, if you're a great host, and you're a fur trader, and you're, you're spending all your time in the woods, probably that means that your wife is really a good host. Because <laughs> 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 he's probably not taking care of the guests. But Kalaji was a really great ho you know, hostess. I mean, she they people love staying there. He made, he made friends. In the War of 1812, he got in trouble because he would not fight for the British. He, he said, no, I'm not going to fight for you. So they arrested him and sent him to Prairie de Chien and held him in house arrest. Uh, the long and the short of it, he lost, pretty much lost everything because of the War of 1812. And he, got, he was kind of stuck at Prairie de Chien. And he was in Prairie de Chien when Colonel Heavy, Henry Leavenworth came. Now, the United States government had decided they were they were going to, they had appropriated money. Is anybody, if anybody wonders why they called Lake Calhoun, Lake Calhoun, is because the Senate Appropriations Committee, that which was chaired by Calhoun, appropriated money for Fort Stelling. That's why Fort, that's why Calhoun was named Lake Calhoun. <laughs> and, and, and if anybody wonders why Lake Harriet is named Lake Harriet, Colonel Henry Leavenworth's third wife was Harriet. And that's why Lake Harriet is called Lake Harriet. It was Leavenworth's wife. So. But he, he came up, and he, was, he had 100, 119 soldiers, and he was assigned the task of coming up to the place where waters meet, right here, and built Fort Snelling. 1819, it was all going to start. They were, were going to build a fort. He stops at Prairie du Chien, comes across from Fort Dearborn in Chicago. He's got a lot of cattle and horses and whatnot, I and mean, he's going to take, take the boat up here. And he, he stays with Fairball and Pelagi. And he says, wow, wonderful, what wonderful host and hostess. And he was really taken back, and he, they really became friends. And he talked Fairbowl, I'll make, let's make a deal. I want you to come. I want you to set up a fur trading post here. I'll protect you. I'll provide you with assistance. I'm going to build a fort, and I want, I want a trading post nearby. You come and, and set up a trading post here. And, then, and part of the deal is I want you to take my cattle and my horses across the country to the fort because I, you know, I'm going to take a boat. So they make a deal. And so Fairbowl comes back. Um, Leavenworth comes here to, he sets up camp right right by the, they call it Cantonot New Hope. It was right underneath the Mendota Bridge, right kind of down the way a little bit. They set up, they get up here in the fall, 1819. Fairbowl brings the uh, animals across. And they have a terrible, terrible time that winter. I think 40 men die from scurvy. But they're, and they're saved by Jean Baptiste Ferdot, who gets some kind of root from some plant or whatever, and he, and he goes out to Little, little Rapids and gets some stuff that saves, basically helps to save the, the troops from more, more troops from dying. So he's, he's treated very, in very high esteem by, by Leavenworth. And, and part of, partly what happened is in the spring, Leavenworth realizes that that place down, right down there, on this side of the river, was a bad spot. So they move across the river to a place where there's a, well, it's called Cold Water Spring. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. But this was a wonderful freshwater spring that the Dakota had been using for, for 
for generations and generations. It was wonderful water, it was a wonderful place, it was healthy. He moved his camp over there, he got some more troops in, and he sits down in the, uh, in the spring of 1820, and we make, he makes a second treaty, because I'm not sure why, I don't know if Leavenworth knew that this treaty of 1805 was, was tainted, that there was problems with it, but they enter into a new treaty. I think, I think part of what was going on is he wanted to show his appreciation for Fairball and Palashi. So in 1820, across again on Pike Island, they make, a, they make a new treaty, and they call it the Treaty of 1820. And basically, this treaty kind of solidified the fact that they were going to build a fort, that the local Dakota were, were approving it, and they were going to um, grant the permission for that to happen. It was, like, it was only 15 acres this time, not 100,000. <laughs> and part of the deal, there was going to be part of the consideration, which is really a curious part of Minnesota history, was that they, they deeded Pike Island to Pelagi, Fairbowl. Really? Not to Jean Baptiste, Pelagi. And, and I don't know if anybody here knows, but in 1820, women couldn't own property in the United States of America. It was illegal for women to own property. Women didn't own property. But Pelagi did. <laughs> she owned my family. And so Fairball and Pelagi set built a place on my family. And Leavenworth then left a couple years later, went out, and he died hunting buffalo out west somewhere. He died he died young. And he was replaced by Josiah Snelly. We know that name of course because the fort became Fort Snelly. And Fort Snelly wasn't real happy with this whole deal with Pelagi and Pike Island. He wanted Pike Island to be a place where they could, I mean, he realized Pike Island was a great spot for their for their horses and their cattle, and because it was right below the fort, it was a great spot, and he didn't really want Fairball and Pelagi living there. But Fairball and Pelagi did live there for a while, uh, but they got flooded out after a couple years, and then they realized this was really not a very good place to live, and it, the flood was pretty bad, so they moved they moved across here, and then they got flooded again, and they moved up here, and they finally built, built the house. But Fairball stayed here, he was an independent fur trader. He didn't work for any company, but he, he had a contract with the American Fur Company. Now, let's talk about some of the other entrepreneurs at the time. So, at the same time that Fairball is in Prairie du Chien, there's another guy called Jean-Joseph Roulette. Every, everybody should know the story about Joseph Roulette. Joseph Roulette is famous because he's the guy that saved St. Paul, uh, saved the capital from being moved to St. Peter. He was on the, the Minnesota Territorial Legislature. Well, well, Joseph Roulette was the son of Jean-Joseph Roulette. Jean-Joseph Roulette was a young man born in Quebec. He was sent to the, he was going to be a priest, went to the seminary, but that didn't work out. So he ended up, through a series of events. He ended up in Prairie du Chien and he ended up being a, uh, the agent for American Fur Company. And he did very well. He was a, described to be a very energetic, full of energy kind of guy, um, always making deals. Uh, he, he had his little phobias with his interest in character. He, he was very afraid of water, which is a problem back then because everybody, all the travel was by water. You can say when he was on a canoe, he would tie a, tie a string from his belt to the rib on the canoe because he was afraid of the canoe. Oh, yeah, okay. gonna, so he always had a string tied. And one of the stories was he was they were on they were in the in the canoe in the middle middle of the winter well, well in the winter time there was ice cubes all over and he was ice birds or whatever ice chunks <laughs> and he was afraid that they were going to tip over and he's he was scared to death and he said mon dieu mon, uh, please God if make me safe get me to the shore if you get me to the shore I promise God I will build you a chapel. <laughs> And they made it to shore. <laughs> and his partner, Dosman, said, so, I, I guess you're going to build a chapel. <laughs> and Mr. Willett said, what are you talking about? It's not in writing. <laughs> <laughs> if he wants to try to collect, let him try to collect. <laughs> but apparently it was a, it was a thing, ongoing thing between Dow Hercules Dosman was one of his partners, and it was an ongoing thing. And eventually, apparently, according to the story, he finally put up money to build a, a church at the Prairie of Shame. At later part of his life, but he he married this woman named Jane Fisher, and they didn't get along very well, and they kind of were separated a lot of their time. He built a big house in Prairie du Chien called the Brisbane House. You can still see it today. 
But he was an interesting guy, and he was in cahoots. He was in cahoots here and doing a lot of fur trade business. And his son, his son was a, was a famous man also. <coughs> and the other thing that went on, I got to move on here. The other interesting thing that, that went on here. So now we're building Fort Snell, and things are getting established. And we got we got this uh, this roulette guy in Curtis Sheen, he's always scheming and whatever. And meanwhile, we got these uh, group, this group called the Selkirk Colonists. We've got this colony up in the Winnipeg area, and they're really having a hard time up there. They're really struggling. And so Roulette comes up with this idea, they need cattle. So, and, and, I, and this is one of the interesting stories, and I want to I do more about this research, Pope, but Roulette and a couple of other entrepreneurs, one of them named uh, Francois Labaf. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He ends up getting killed during the U.S. Dakota War of uh, 1862. He had a place in Morton, Mort, Minnesota, where he got killed. But they came up with a scheme. They're going to they're gonna drive 150 cattle from Prairie Sheen to Winnipeg in 1821. Now imagine that. There's no bridges. I mean, there's no wild territory. There's it's uh, there's no settlements really. There's a few great fur trading posts, and there are four guys that drove 150 head of cattle, and they drove it all the way up the Red River to Winnipeg to the Selkirk Colony. And the uh, the claim is that they got 100 bucks of cattle or something. But it, I mean, what a scheme! And they 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 pulled it off. And and one of the guys and here's a here's a picture of. Uh, the young, this is the Joseph Rolette Jr., the guy that saved St. Paul's capital from being moved to St. Peter. But the other guy was this guy named Alexei Bailey. And he was part of this cattle drive. He was a young guy. He was, his grandmother was a, an Ottawa woman from the Mackinac area. His father was a fur trader uh, in his own right, very successful fur trader. And in fact, his father's house if you go to, if anybody's ever been to the Indiana Dunes State Park, mm -hmm. his father's house is there, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. And you can actually go and tour his father's house in that in, in the, near the Chicago area. And so he came from the family. His his grandfather, his name was Shell, and his grandfather was was a soldier with the, the French during the French and Indian War, and he was present. At the only time that George Washington ever surrendered his army, at a place called Fort Necessity, I don't know if anybody's ever heard that, but his grandfather was there when George Washington surrendered to the French because they were surrounded and they were overwhelmed and they made a deal. That's the only time that George Washington ever ever surrendered to his wife. <clears throat> he was an interesting guy. He he fought in the. Uh, War of 18, well, no, he did not fight in the War of 1812 because he was born in, in uh, 1798. He was, he was too young. Went to school in Montreal. Uh, one of the first things he did when he got out of school, he, he wanted a life of adventure. He, had a, he delivered a message from Montreal to Winnipeg on behalf of Lord Selkirk's wife, who was in Montreal at the time, and wanted to deliver a message to her husband, who was up in the Winnipeg area. So he got, to, he got familiar with the Red River area and the Red River settlement, and he ended up getting somehow down to Perdicheen, working for Roulette for a while, and was part of a, a venture where they went up and they worked in the Red River land. They, had, they started to develop a trade route because after this cattle drive, they realized that there was this interest in a trade between the Winnipeg, the, the Selkirk colonists, and here. And there started to become some uh, communication and, and trade that went on between the two areas. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny story in the sense that after the War of 1812, they drew the border, and the Selkirk colonists kind of fell apart. It wasn't working out very well because they lost title to the land. The United States government became the owner of the land south of the border, and it was kind of it's kind of a big mess. They were having trouble with with the uh, you know, they had grasshoppers, and it was cold as hell up there for a bit up there. It was just a tough time. There was it was a tough place to have a colony, and they were they started developing this trade between St. Paul, because now Fort Stanley was built, and they did this cattle drive, and they realized that there was this supply line that would went south. And it was controlled by the Hudson Bay Company at the time, and they didn't want, the Hudson Bay Company wanted all the people up in that area to trade with them, which is a, which is a northern trade route. 
and now we had this get these roulettes and these Alexi Bailey's and other guys who were trying to develop the little trade going south. And that that upset the Hudson Bay Company and it upset the British government. They didn't want they didn't want those their people doing their trade coming down here. So this is kind of a funny story. So they the British government sends 350 troops up to Winnipeg and they're gonna stop the illegal trade <coughs> coming south. Enough is enough. They're gonna all the trade is gonna go through the Hudson Bay. And they get up there in September. And they got no food. And they're up there short of supplies. And Hudson Bay is frozen. <laughs> so they're in trouble. So what do they do? They come down here and they <laughs> <laughs> And this is true. It's a true story. That kind of ended that thing. So now we got now we've got Sibley and Henry Sibley, of course, this is the Sibley historic site. So Alexi Bailey is the you know, he does a cattle drive, he's working roulette, and then he gets hired to be the American Fur Company agent, and he comes and he sets up shop here. So he's the agent now. You got you got John Baptiste Faribault, who's an independent fur trader, and you got Lexi Bailey, who's the agent for American Fur Company, and he's working here. But apparently Lexi Bailey gets bored or whatever, so he decides to start his own business on the side, and he, and he gets discovered, and so that didn't work very well. So they, they basically fire him. They want to get a replacement, and their, their replacement is Henry Sibley. And he, he comes here and sets up shop in 1834. So now we're up to the 1834. And, and meanwhile, we've got this trade going on with the ox carts, and we've got some of these silver colonies, people starting to come down. We start to have this business going up there. And the fur trade company is still going okay, so Sibley comes in and takes over. And, you know, he becomes the first governor of the state of Minnesota. But, you know, this is a French heritage uh, talk. But Sibley is this French speaking person he, and he also does a lot with French Canadians and in fact he has a very good relationship with the French Canadian voyagers and he he describes them in, in very positive tones he, he, he loved working with his French Canadian voyagers he, uh, he makes an, he makes a number of positive statements in his writings about how much he liked working with French Canadian voyagers one of the statements is that it affords me pleasure to hear witness to the fidelity and honesty of the Canadian French voyagers, which I found abundant occasion to prove. And so there was a very good relationship that he had with his, because most of the people in that, at that time that were working in the fur trade business were French Canadians. They were voyagers, they were people that were connected with the, the local natives. And he, they had a good relationship with him. And the French Canadians also had a lot of respect for Henry Sibley. And so he did, he did very well with them. He, he, uh, he, like most of the people of the day, had a relationship with a Dakota woman. He had a child named Helen Sibley. And uh, this is a Sibley house. Here's his daughter, Helen, born in 1841. And he took care of his daughter. There's no indication that I can find anywhere that he ever uh, did anything other than love his daughter and take care of her and he supported her. And she ended up marrying a doctor, um, a man named Dr. Sawyer but apparently died shortly thereafter and never had any kids. She died, I think, of scarlet fever. She didn't live very long, but, just, but she was taken care of. And, he, and she, he had this connection, close connection with the French Canadians, and also he had a close connection with the Dakota. Um, and he got along well with them. And so now what I want to do is just talk, in my last 15 minutes, i got about 15 minutes left, I want to just kind of go talk about some of the other French, French Canadian people that, that Sibley worked with. Kind of like I call them the, uh, the, the friends of, of Sibley. And we'll, we'll talk about a few of these. There's quite a few of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about several of them, but not all of them. But let's, let's talk about some of these guys. That, one of them is George Bonga. And I, he's an interesting person because he was an African American. His father came with his master from Haiti or Santo Domingue, he was French speaking, and then was made a free free person and opened a tavern in the Michelin Mackinac area, Mackinac, Mackinac Island, and did very well. And George Baga was educated and trained and became a fur trader. And a lot of stories about him. He he worked a little bit with Sibley, you know, not a lot. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with George Baga, but 
one of the legends about him is that he was really an incredibly strong person and that he could carry 700 pounds of furs on, on his back. And that was the legend. Was it true? It seems like an awful lot of fur, but he was a very strong person. Another guy that Sibley would work with and made deals with and, and, Chate and Pierre Chateau was involved in a, a number of schemes and investments in Minnesota at the time, including the Oxcar Trail North, was Pierre Chateau. And he was from St. Louis. The Chateau family were wealthy and one of the founders. They did a lot of fur trading, made a lot of money. Anybody here of uh, Pierre, South Dakota? Anybody wonder where Pierre, South Dakota got his name? Well, it's not Pierre, it's Pierre. But never tell a South Dakota guy that. <laughs> it's Pierre. No, it's Pierre. No, it's Pierre. Anyway, Pierre, because that's what they call it. We'll, we'll call it what they want to call it. Pierre, South Dakota is named not after Pierre Chateau Jr., but after his brother. So, But it's named after Chateau. That's where the name comes from. Interestingly enough, because he's a... Another, another person that... I got to talk to about, I'm talking about a Dota, is of course it led to Puy. And of course, where are we right now? We're in the Dupuy house. And he, he was a interesting character. He he had a lot of energy. He started out, uh, he was a fur trader, born in Montreal, Quebec. He ended up in uh, working for uh, Joseph Renville out of Lockheed Parle, married one of Joseph Renville's daughters, and worked there for a time. And then he was hired by Sibley. He came here and he worked here and built the house. And they had a store here, they had a general store in his house, apparently, and he was in charge of that. They say he was a guy that loved to talk, full of, full of uh, uh, fun and spirit, and he, when he get really excited, you know, you don't want to be around because he'd, he'd be all over the place, and they said he would, when he got excited, he would talk in a mixed language of Patois, Dakota, and English, and nobody could understand him. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a little firebrand, and apparently uh, didn't. Did very well. He was the uh, postmaster here, and I think he was also uh, one of the, the commissioners in the town. But a well-loved and, of course, well-remembered French Canadian person because we're in his house. Then there was the uh, the Browns, Joseph Brown and Susan Frenier Brown, and they had a place out uh, by Lake Traverse. They were they had a fur trading post. Joseph Brown was a, was a drummer boy that first came with Leavenworth in 1819, of course, telling he was just a kid, but he stayed around here. And he married Susan Frenier. And Susan Frenier was the daughter of a fur trader. And, and an interesting story is that Joseph Brown, and then there's, there's Joseph Renville. Joseph Renville also had a place out there, and he's, he's a famous person. His father was a, I believe to be a Rainville. I think we might have a Rainville in this. this Room, I just had, I could just feel a rainville somewhere. <laughs> his father was a rainville. His mother was the, the daughter of the of the little crow, so they, there was a connection there. And interesting, Joseph Brown and Joseph Renville couldn't stand each other. They would fight all the time, and Sibley was always trying to break them up and stop them from fighting. And they're always they're always criticizing each other. And part of the reason might have been Joseph Brown didn't like Joseph Renville, and part of the reason might have been that Joseph Renville and Henry Sibley were doing target practice one day, and they were shooting a pistol, and Susan Frenier, who was Joseph, Weiss, Joseph Brown's wife, who was 16 years old at the time, was accidentally shot by Joseph Renville when the, when the pistol discharged, and the bullet went right through her. Oh, and she lived. She it was apparently went, went through right here, and it didn't destroy any vital, vital organs, but she survived, and she married. Joseph Brown, but Joseph Brown was always complaining about Joseph Renville. Joseph Renville was, you know, uh, part French and part Dakota. He looked more Dakota than anything. When you look at his picture, I'll, I'll have to show you. A, let me show you a picture. Here's Susan Frenier, and, and, and of course, she was part Native American also. And I'm going to show you uh, Joseph Renville here. Here's Joseph Renville. And you know, he's part French, but he really looks very native. He really looks very native there. But Joseph Brown was always complaining about Joseph Renville. And the problem was, is what Joseph Renville did with his treaty, because they're all they're all working for the American Fur Company and, and Sibley's trying to keep everybody happy. And they would give, you know, they had these trade goods, and they give the trade goods to their their uh, 
trappers or the voyagers and then go out in the wintertime and do all their thing and do their trading and come back in the spring with their furs. And Joseph Renville would always just give, he would give everybody equal amount of trade goods every spring, no matter how good or bad they were. Because they were good traders, they're good fur traders, fur trappers, and bad trappers. But, but Renville treated everybody the same every spring. And it drove Joseph Brown nuts. He said, you can't do it that way. It's not fair. But, but Joseph Renville's argument was, I, I treat everybody equally every year. They get to start fresh. And then there's no jealousy, nobody gets angry, and nobody gets upset. Because that was a problem in those days. People would get angry and upset, and bad things would happen. And Joseph Renville didn't have those problems, because he always treated everybody equally. Now, did he make as much money as some of the other traders? Maybe not, but it seemed to work for him. Other people that I want to talk a little bit about, uh, Joseph Godfrey uh, was a person who worked for Sibley for a time and ended up leaving. He was, his father was a Godfrey, his mother was a African slave, he was a mulatto I guess you'd call it. And it's called Godfrey but his family really was Godfrey. They were, there was a commander at uh, Fort Beauharnois in Lake Peppa who was a Godfrey. They were a family of, of military commanders and military people so his father probably was a man of some distinction, and the name got anglicized to Godfrey. But his, his story, he worked for Sibley for a while, and then he decided he didn't want to work anymore, and he ran off with a Dakota woman and married and went out and lived on the Minnesota River and got caught up in the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, and he was accused of, of fighting against the, the Minnesota people, and they were threatened, they threatened to execute him, but he ended up being a witness against some other Indians, and he, his life was saved. But interesting story. Mm -hmm. Then there's Joseph Lafmoise. He was a fur trader, and he had his fur trading post. Let's see, he was down on the Iraq trading post on the Minnesota River, just up Minnesota, I mean, that way on the Minnesota River, a little ways. Interesting guy. He was a he was a, a interpreter. He ended up working with the Indians as far as interpreting. He was a guide for John Nicollet. We all know about who John Nicollet is because there's Nicollet Avenue and all that's named after the guy. He, he drew a really great map of Minnesota. And Joseph Lampoix, who also worked for Sibley, was connected with the American Fur Company, was his guide. And Joseph Lampoix had a very interesting mother. If you ever go to Mackinac Island, you'll see this place called the Harvard View Inn. Yeah. That is Joseph Lampoix's mother's house. And she was, his mother's name was Madeline, and she has been elected to the state of Michigan's Women's Hall of Fame because her, her husband, she was a Marcotte, and she married Lampoix, who had this fur trading company, her husband died. And she just carried on the business. In fact, she carried on the business much better than her husband had, and she made a lot of money. She was a very, very successful woman in Mackinac Island, and you go there in her place, it's a beautiful place. So she was a very, uh, and in those days, women didn't do that very often, so she was an exceptional woman, and Joseph was her was her son. Another person who lived in the area during the time, I've got five minutes left here, was uh, Pierre Pig's Eye. Of course, we all know about Pig's Eye. Famous guy. He lived. He lived around here. He was selling whiskey, and Snelly didn't like it, so they kicked him out. And he went down the river by by St. Paul. And of course, we all know who he is. And the name was called Pig's Eye Settlement for a while, based after Pig's Eye. Then there was a Louis Provencal, and this is a painting by Louis Mayer. He was down by Traverse de Sioux area. He was a fur trader, explorer, born in born in Quebec. Um, he was, he was nicknamed Little White, or Petit Le Bon. Apparently both a vivacious guy, with a very free, free spirit, very loving. He, uh, he, he didn't know how to read or write, but he, could, he would keep track of his things. He had this great little pictorial uh, hieroglyphics. So he'd keep track of things by drawing little pictures. And was, he did an excellent job at that. He, and then back in those days, the, the currency was rats. Muskrats. So if you want to negotiate something, you wanted to buy something, it was in rats. And you wanted to buy a gun, it was 100 rats. You wanted to buy a, a blanket, how, how much for their blanket? 
Oh, I, 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 I think I need uh, 22 rats for that one. It's all rats. He would do little rats for his, his little bird. He did pretty well. <laughs> And he apparently had this, this uh, you know, he was a very free loving guy and he treated everybody pretty, pretty nice. But if you crossed him, watch out. One time, apparently, the, uh, these, these uh, Indian trappers were unhappy about him and there's something and they were threatening him. And he, there was a big thing of gunpowder and he had his uh, torch. And he says, You guys get out of here, I'm going to blow this place up. <coughs> and they got out of it, they believed <laughs> So that leads us to the. Back to the Selkirk colony, because I just wanted to talk a little bit about that last. I got a few minutes left. So we've got Fort Snelling. We've got this trade route now starting between Selkirk colonists in, in this area. And like I said, this is this is a birthplace. This is where it all began. This is where it began for the Dakota people, and this is really where it began for the state of Minnesota. And what really got things going was failure of the Selkirk colony up north. And and there's a tradition by the Dakota people, they believe that, well, I, I don't know they believe it, but the theory is that the people came from the north. And they did kind of come to the north because the Ojibwe kicked them out, so they did come from the north. But the first settlers of Minnesota didn't come from the south, didn't come from the west, didn't come from the east, they came from the north. They came from the Selkirk colonists. They started coming down and Snelling would let them stay at the military reservation for a time. And their numbers started to grow, the trade started to grow, and that led basically to the point where they realized that we were going to need to make an, make an agreement with the Indians. There were some, also some other pressures. We got the ox cards. And really, the beginning began in the Treaty of 1837. There, was, there were two different treaties. There were treaties with the Dakota and the Ojibwe, and they made a treaty to deed over. The Indians gave up their rights to the land east of the Mississippi and between the St. Croix, and that really started the development. The Selkirk colonists that come down here were on a military reservation. They were told they had to leave. They went to St. Paul, and that's really the beginning of the state of Minnesota. The settlement began really in 1837. The Treaty of 1837. So, and the French, of course, that's a little bit, a little story about how the French were involved in the early beginnings of this birthplace, this place where water was made. Okay, so that's an hour. I don't, I, I can have a couple, if anybody want to ask any questions, I can answer, try to answer a couple questions. Otherwise, yes? Yeah. What years were the ox carts? Well, they, they, you know, the, I think it all started with the cattle drive. And then after that, they, they had a route. They started a route. So they then they started. They started. Uh, there started to be some some traffic, and then they, it, it it kind of started to grow. And of course, what you know, the whole fiasco with the British troops and whatever. And then it really picked up. And and uh, this this the whole trade started with up north, and they called it the Pemmican trade. And Pemina is Pemina, North Dakota, is, is named after Pemmican. But what what was going on, you know, in the 1840s? And that's when it really picked up. They had these huge buffalo hunts up in North Dakota. And they'd go out there and they, they had these huge buffalo hunts and they'd kill many buffalo. And they would they would take the meat from the buffalo and they'd dry it. They had pemmican, pemmican factories and they'd dry the meat. And they had all the uh, the fur from the from the buffalo. And they'd bring it down by ox cart. They'd bring it down here. And they'd put it on the ships. And they'd bring it to St. Louis. And what was going on in St. Louis in the 1840s? What was going on? Everybody was going west. Wagon trains. Yes. And what's nice to have on a wagon train? Dried meat, and buffalo hides. Right. They, they got this trade going back and forth. And, and of course, my my ancestor, I've got a ancestor who came here in 1836. He was he was a, a, a clerk for the Northwest Company up in the in, so in the River of Land. And then the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company were having this thing called the Pemmican War and they Ended up the Hudson Bay Company ended up buying out the Northwest Company, and he probably lost his job like a lot of the Northwest Company people did. And he ended up coming down with his family. There were apparently 60 of them that came in 1836. He came down here. He, he settled for a while in the military reservation. And as far as I know, and I want to do more research on this, uh, one of my future projects. He got a, he was a voyager. He got a job 
you know, like John Baptiste uh, Faribault was an independent voyager. He made a deal with the American Fur Company. He would buy all his, his goods and stuff from the American Fur Company. He got a one third markup, and then he would hire three voyagers. The voyagers would buy the goods from him, and then they'd get, go out and trade with the Indians and bring back the furs, and they get paid so much for the furs. There was this whole profit thing going on. And I think a lot of the people, like my ancestor, came down here and had a job working as a voyager during the wintertime. In the summertime, they would farm because the fur trade really was a winter industry. That's when you would get the furs. That's when you wanted to get the furs. And he settled in St. Paul. They, they pulled this whole French community, Canadian community started in St. Paul. And a lot of most Jean-Baptiste Faribault had a son, Alexander. And Alexander got a license to start a uh, fur trading post down on the Cannon River <coughs> the area. And the town of Faribault is named after his son, Alexander Faribault. And, and actually, in his later years, Jean-Baptiste, in his later years, uh, got into a little pro he, he one of the uh, traders was upset because he didn't have something and he didn't get stabbed in the back and it pierced his lungs. He survived, but he, you know, that was kind of, he didn't do very well after that. He ended up going living with his son in Faribault, Minnesota. So that's where Faribault, Minnesota comes from, his son Alexander. In fact, there's a house in, in Faribault on the National Register. I think it's on the, I think it's on the National Register of Historic Places. But anyway, it's, it's a historic house in Faribault. And you can go see where Alexander Faribault lived. That was the son of John Baptiste. We just went, me and my cousin just went to the cemetery up here, and we noticed that there's a gravestone in the cemetery of Jean Baptiste Faribault, who was born, when was he born? Is that? 1942. 1942 and died, uh, yeah. So probably must have been uh, extended to Jean Baptiste. Anyway, that's an hour. An hour is long enough for any talk. I appreciate coming, and we'll, we're going to, we do this. Uh,